Thracia 776 is a game widely known as the most difficult Fire Emblem game in the series. This is because of its unique mechanics that the game expects you to be able to use effectively right at the start with little explanation. One of these new mechanics includes capturing, which allows you to kidnap enemies, steal their weapons, and release them peacefully into the wild. This, of course, had me asking the question, can you beat Thracia 776 while saving everyone? Now, what exactly does this challenge entail, you may ask? Well, the rules are pretty simple. During the gameplay, if we attack and kill an enemy unit, we lose. If one of our ally units gets killed, we also lose. And if an NPC green unit kills or gets killed, we lose. If the dialogue tells us someone has died, that will not count since we weren't involved. But if we do have the chance to unlock new dialogue from saving an NPC or enemy, we will be forced to do so. Anyway, without further delay, let's start our challenge in the village of Fianna, where our main character Leaf grew up in after running away from Leonster Castle. When we arrive at Fianna, there's a group of enemies going to Munster with our friends Nana and Marita. After hearing the news, Leaf decides it's his time to shine and that he won't let the enemy get away with this, except for the fact their punishment will be a slap on the wrist. Our starting units for this chapter were Leaf, Finn, Halvin, Osain, and Avel. The first turn was spent inching closer to the first enemy of the game, and I thought I could get some chip damage in with Leaf during enemy phase, but neither of us were able to land a hit. During turn 2, we were able to capture our very first enemy of the game, who shows us a feature where all of our stats, besides HP and luck, get cut in half until we release them. On turn 3, we get the units Dagdar, Tanya, and Marty, and the rest of the chapter contains me getting closer and closer to each enemy and letting them scurry off one by one. There was also some houses I was able to visit to get some items and the Puji, which is a weapon only Osan can use. I thought the boss was going to be a problem, but he was surprisingly easy to defeat since Dagdar was able to handle him. We seized the mansion in 20 turns. Chapter 2. This chapter brings us to the village of Iz, which is on the way to Munster. While we're here, we see some pirates plundering the village. It was pretty much the same as the previous chapter, capture the enemies, set them free, and visit the houses to get items. One of these houses also gives us a new unit, Ronin. He's an archer who won't be doing anything this run, unfortunately. When we reached the boss, Bucks, I thought I could use Avel to capture him. Unfortunately, this was not an option. Why not, you may be thinking. Well, in this game, there's a little stat called Constitution, and this decides whether or not you are able to capture a unit. So, if you have less Constitution than an enemy, you'll only be able to attack. As you can see, Bux has 12 Constitution, and Avel only has 8. Thankfully, mounted units such as Finn ignore the Constitution rule and have theirs capped at 20, which is the max number for all stats other than HP. This is going to be important later, trust me. Since we visited all the houses in this chapter, we get rewarded with Chapter 2X, which is the Guidance Chapter. These chapters are side quests, but they can be very important in some cases. This one in particular greets us with Fog of War. This makes faraway spaces completely pitch black. This forces us to be careful where we place our stronger units because they can very well defeat the groups of pirates coming our way that might initiate an attack. My strategy for this was to keep the weaker or slower units in front while having units able to deal chip damage in the back so Marty and Finn could capture the pirates. After a while, we were able to successfully snatch a torch which lets us see 10 spaces ahead of us. This made things a lot clearer and let us know about the archers ahead of us. After a while, it did get a little bit overwhelming, but we were still able to persevere through the map. All we needed to do to get by now was to capture Shiva with his killing edge I really wanted, and Lephis who we could capture instantly because he doesn't carry any weapons. Shiva, on the other hand, is extremely strong, but with a bit of luck, Finn can steal his sword. At the end of the chapter, Lephis, who we saved, decides to join our team. He is very valuable because of steel, which is a skill where if the unit has more speed than an enemy unit, they can steal weapons and items from them, so long as the weight of the item does not exceed their constitution. Chapter 3 brings us to Kerberos Gate, and we once again see the enemy who kidnapped Marita and Nana. In addition, they also kidnapped four green units from the nearby village. This is our very first green unit protection mission. If we bring the children back to their homes, we successfully protect them, and we get some items as a bonus. We are also told that we cannot have mounted units inside the fortress. Thankfully, there is a dismount option, but we will lose constitution in the process. My strategy was simple. 
I would defeat the enemies on the top half with most of my units, and keep the bottom half for the others who could defeat reinforcements. Since this chapter gave us Safi, a staff user, there weren't any problems besides being able to miss staff hits. We were able to defeat every enemy and then bring the children to their homes. The boss was quite difficult, but possible to capture. Chapter 4. After seizing the throne at Kerberos Gate, we reunite with Nana, but not in the way we'd like to. We get thrown into prison. While in this prison, a group called the Magi comes to save us. The Magi group includes Brighton, Lara, and Macha. These units will prove to be very useful, but for now we should probably look at their stats. Brighton has well-rounded stats with a good amount of constitution. Lara has good speed and luck, very little constitution, but has steel, and Macha has good speed, skill, and decent constitution. The only problem with these stats is that our enemies have higher constitution than everyone besides Brighton. And when we open up the jail cell Lyphis is in, the brigands will work together to defeat the enemies. So this isn't really a one-man job like it looks like right now. Another thing to know is if an enemy doesn't have a weapon, green units will refuse to attack them unless their constitution is lower than the enemy. But of course, both Lyphis and Lara can't steal their weapons since they need at least least 9 constitution to carry the weapon. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a solution to this though. By simply backtracking a bit, we can go back to chapter 3 where we first get to use Lyphis. We can see he starts out at 6 constitution, so if we want this to work out for us, we'd need to level up 3 times while getting all of those levels to include constitution. Since his constitution growth rate is at 10, that gives us a 1 in 1000 chance of actually getting this insane luck. So I decided to do a little RNG abusing. Task speedrunner Lepong36 created a script that shows me all the random numbers this game is going to pick. I'll pick the topic back up in a little while, but for now we can free Lyphis from his jail and steal the weapons of all the guards to force them away from the NPCs that would attack them. This was also the chapter I realized I could block reinforcements from continuously respawning by simply stepping on their spawn points. We needed some more help to block the spawns, so I released Leaf who was with Fergus and Karen who are now on our team. I stayed still until around turn 20 when the brigands would start to take their leave. At this point, I decided to enclose a single poor soldier to one space to do a trick for the easiest XP farm in any Fire Emblem game. Since both Lara and Lyphis are faster than this enemy, we can easily steal items from this enemy and give the item back to get 20 XP each round of trading. Now we can talk about the numbers running past each turn which can help us with rigging RNG values. Usually you do this for hitting low percent hits or crits, but in this case we're actually rigging our level stats as mentioned earlier. The most important stats we're looking for this time are constitution, speed, and move, which is a stat you can grow for some reason. The reason we are able to get the perfect numbers we need for this is because of something called RN burning. You can burn RNs in various ways. Waiting, opening and closing the inventory, pressing any button on the d-pad while viewing attack statistics, moving diagonally without anything interfering on a nearby space, and for some reason hovering over Finn. This helps Lyphis and Lara level up to 20, giving them max constitution, speed, and move. Honestly, I thought this would be enough for the next chapter, but I was wrong. Chapter 4X is a continuation of the previous chapter. We are now deeper into the prison and we meet with Sed and Asbel. Sed and Asbel are green units that will attack enemies, and since they aren't the bad guys according to the game, they will one-shot the enemy any chance they get. This means we have a single turn to save these soldiers. I rigged my RNG extremely hard to be able to not only capture two enemies to reveal the door, but also unlock the door, give our units multiple moves using the movement star mechanic, save the two soldiers in front of Sed and Asbel, and not kill the enemies ourselves because we are all over leveled now. Even with everything going perfectly, Sed can just phase through us and attack. I knew I had to get stronger. Everyone had to so we could stop this bloodthirsty mage. So I spent a very long time in chapter 4, 888 turns to be exact, grinding XP for everyone so we could save these enemies. And yes, this optional chapter isn't very optional since we need to save 7 green units captured in the jail. After hours of grinding, we can finally go back to 4x to get a real attempt in. And of course, I discovered I did not have to play harder. I just had to play much smarter. <gasps> no way! I totally forgot you could capture green units. 
This entire chapter was made easy because we could drag Set around by his ankles. Chapter 5 Now that we're out of prison, we reach Monster Castle where Avel and Nana get reunited. They also meet three evil friends. We needed to save them before it's too late, so I decided to use turn 1 to capture four of these enemies or at least steal their weapons, which makes them deactivate. For turn two, I moved all my units forward through this hallway and opened the door to the pit with Lithis. This automatically starts a cutscene and Leaf walks to the door. During this scene, Avel gets warped by Veld, a dark bishop who could wield the Petrify Staff. This staff turns Avel to stone, making her unusable. And as the kidnapper Radric says, there is no rescuing a block of stone. We are forced to leave her in Monster Castle, giving us our first death of the game. However, this run is not over just yet. After capturing and releasing all the attacking enemies in this chapter, Chapter 6 gives us some insight into a possible way to reverse the petrification of Avel. We get the news that there is a sacred artifact known as the Kaya Staff, but there is a seal placed on it that only allows people of Archbishop Manfroy's bloodline to use it. So even though she might be dead now, we have a chance, although very low, to save her and reverse our counter back to zero. This current chapter wants us to escape Monster, and since we are very prepared, we bring all our enemies to safety including Galzis, who almost has maxed out stats. We also visited the houses in the area to get items and a unit named Hicks. We leveled them up a bit using a broken axe, and somehow this chapter was when I realized not only can you use the shops, but enemies can also use them if they have no weapons. What? They can use the shop? Anyway, it's an easy escape chapter, and I should let you guys know I won't be saying when I grind for XP, just expect I did if a unit is actually being used. Chapter 7 is also an escape chapter. Leaf is advised to seek aid from Thracia, but ignores the advice and heads towards Tara. There aren't that many enemies in this chapter we need to attack, besides this group of Myrmidons. We just need to run towards Castle Meath to beat this chapter. We also get reunited with Finn and Safi during this chapter, and after reaching the castle, we recruit Ocean, Halvin, and Ronan once again. We also recruited Shiva, one of the Myrmidons, if we captured him without releasing him. Chapter 8 in this chapter, we're brought to Mount Voidrake, which marks the end of Act 1 and the beginning of Act 2. I have chapters separated like this when specific features are shown, and this act shows us fatigue. This is a feature in this game where you cannot use a unit for a chapter if their fatigue is higher than their HP. And since you can gain fatigue each time you gain XP, almost all our units are fatigued and cannot be used. All except for the ones we just gained. This includes a new unit we get for this chapter, Kallion. He's a mounted unit like Finn, so we don't have to worry about constitution with him. This chapter wasn't very difficult. We released each enemy one by one and recruited Mari again by talking with them using Ocean. The boss for this chapter is Rumei, and he's the only boss in this game under a time limit. After 16 turns, he will be uncapturable since he'd become mounted, but if we reach him before then, he's not that bad. Chapter 8x brings us to Dagdar's Manor, another Fog of War map. Since we didn't use a lot of our units in the previous chapter, their fatigue gets reset and we can use them for this chapter. This chapter also lets us use Tanya and Dagdor again, and I never explained this, but I did give both of them a ton of vulnerary for this specific chapter. It's hard to see through the fog, but there are 9 enemies right ahead of Dagdar, and since he has good HP, I let him capture Tanya so she won't get one shot, and I camped in the corner so Dagdar can tank all the hits. It took a couple of turns to get Leaf and the gang over to save Dagdar, but other than the enemies being able to poison us, this chapter wasn't too difficult. Chapter 9 brings us to a mountainous area near Hannibal's villa, and this chapter has us both protect the escape point on the villa as well as needing to escape through it. This is our first defense chapter in the game, and honestly, it's not too difficult. I mainly use Lifus and Lara to confiscate the enemy weapons, but for the enemies we will need to capture, it doesn't seem to go well once we have the flyers to worry about. Because they are mounted units, they have 20 constitution, and to be able to carry enemies, we will need more constitution than the enemy. And if their stat is at max, there's really no way of going about this. So instead of carrying them, we have to steal their weapons and block the shops so they can't buy weapons. It's a bit scary to think about, because at any moment, we could get a seize chapter where the boss is a mounted unit or just has 20 constitution. It's a simple thing, but if it does occur, we will have no choice but to kill. As a side note though, this chapter is one of the only ones to sell stamina drinks in their shops. This drink removes fatigue from our units, and it's really useful, so we're going to have to stock up just in case, since as I said earlier, you cannot use a unit that is fatigued. 
Chapter 10. This chapter brings us to the border between Thracia and Munster, and it has a ton of enemies including Ballista. This chapter was extremely hard since I went into battle already on turn 1, which I definitely shouldn't have. But all our units somehow survived everything perfectly. We even got to steal Alwyn and Fred's weapons, which I'm very surprised was possible. The boss was easy after we got all the pests out of the way. Honestly, I'm surprised we've gotten this far without needing to defeat any enemies. This challenge is a lot more interesting than I would have thought, and when completing this chapter without killing the boss, you actually get told how just and forthright this playstyle is since we captured him rather than killing him. Chapter 11 takes place at Fort Dandrum. It's surprisingly easy if you're able to take out each enemy one by one and let Leaf into this more open area last so we can talk to Fred to make him an ally. The boss also cannot be killed and decides to run away instead. Chapter 11X is also extremely easy. It is fog of war, but that doesn't really make much of a difference when I have a guy for the map on my web browser at all times. Saving the green units wasn't difficult. Recruiting Alwyn was also a breeze, and capturing the boss was as easy as ever. Chapter 12, once again, Fog of War, but this one is extremely annoying. For the first and second turn, I brought Karen to this house while carrying Olwyn so we can get a Crusader Scroll and a Magic Ring. I didn't actually need to do this, but I decided I should just in case. For those same turns, I brought the rest of my group upwards to take out some bandits. The only problem here was that there's a coin flip for RNG in this chapter, whether or not the boss Salem uses his sleep staff. This is a status effect that makes a unit fall asleep for the rest of the chapter. It only has three uses, but it is our top priority in this chapter since it's one of the most useful items in the game. Why is it so important? If you use it on a mounted unit, they will become unmounted, and you can capture units that are asleep immediately, so long as they don't have equal or more constitution than you. This chapter was not too difficult as long as you get to Salem fast enough before he puts you to sleep. Chapter 12x, once again, another fog chapter. Don't worry, there's only two more of these in the game after this. This was a pretty condensed chapter though, so I took a lot of time to plan out every turn. For the first turn, Safi warps Lara to this spot so she can steal the thief staff from Tina. After that, Lara gets a second move and I can use it to talk to Perny, which is now our third thief unit, and he reclasses Lara into a dancer who can still use thief skills. The dance skill allows a unit to move a second time. It is one of the most important skills in this game. I move Finn towards an enemy so they'll be visible on the map. Then I capture the enemy with Matcha so Leaf can walk up the hallway and use a torch. After that, I block the hallways so the enemies wouldn't get in our way when they try to escape. Enemies normally don't escape like this, but for some reason after recruiting Perny, they will start running away. But since they usually go to their closest escape point, we can use this to our advantage since there's one unit in the darkness we can still recruit. I use the sleep staff to stop him from escaping so we can capture him, which automatically recruits for the next chapter. Then we can take the next turns to move Saf over to Tina since she'll be recruitable. After that, we're pretty much done with the chapter and can move on to chapter 13, which is the map where we need to defend the gates of Tara. And we only have two turns before Glade and his generic units get attacked. So for turn 1 and 2, I move our units as far as possible, and on turn 3, I completely block the gate and avoid all attacks. It's honestly impressive how simple this was, but now we're on to chapter 14, which is yet another defense chapter. This time, we'll need to defend the city for 10 turns, and like last chapter, all we need to do is stand still the whole time. Since we had extra units though, we can visit some houses that'll unlock a Gaiden chapter. In addition to this, we also get a Crusader scroll from our new ally Dean. I don't think I've explained this yet, but these scrolls change the growth rates of our units while they're held. I didn't level up Safi at all for this moment in particular. This is because she's the only unit in the entire game with 0% growth rates for movement. And this scroll will change that to 5%. Chapter 14X. After saving the city, Lenoan joins our team. She's another staff user which will come in handy. And this is one of the last Fog of War maps, thankfully. And it's not that difficult, but it's very tedious. Every couple of turns, some green units will appear and they can get captured by enemy reinforcements that we are unable to stop. Half the reinforcements are mages, and the other half are flyers. It's terrible. I had to rescue the green units as well as the staff users I brought for this. On the bright side, most of the mages have rewarp, a staff that allows the user to move wherever we want. Now we have like 
13 of these, but they're really useful, so I'm not complaining. The boss was easy, and we were able to get 6 stamina drinks from the green units after letting them escape. Chapter 15. I like to call this the beginning of the final act. This is because there are split paths with different ways to play depending on which one you pick. So before we get into the chapter, we should probably decide what we're going to be wanting. First on the list is the items. The most notable items in the fort path are three sleep edges, which put enemies to sleep after hitting them once, a warp staff, rescue staff, and a sleep staff. The forest path includes one sleep edge and a berserk staff, which makes enemies attack each other, which doesn't really seem very useful. The next thing on our choice list would be root possibility, and this shows us that the fort path is impossible because of the boss with 20 constitution. This means we are forced to take the forest path. It does have worse items, but at least everyone will be safe. Thankfully, getting to the forest path isn't very difficult. We had to use a stamina drink on Safi so she could warp Leaf to the top of the map and step on this tile. This is the tile one of the green units that appear on turn 1 will always gravitate towards for an enemy kill. Leaf is there to stop that, and it works great. We can also protect the houses nearby during the other turns. Capturing our enemies wasn't too difficult after turn 1, so we can move to the right side of the map to reach chapter 16's forest path, which isn't difficult at all, but it's absolutely important to prioritize talking to Sarah, who spawns in after turn 1. This is because she is the granddaughter of Manfroy, who as I said earlier, has put a seal on the Kaya staff, which is the only way to bring back Avel from her petrification. This means Sarah is our ticket to removing the one death on our counter. Other than that, stealing the Berserk Staff and the Sleep Edge wasn't very difficult. Chapter 17 was also not very difficult at all. Chapter 18, on the other hand, wasn't that easy. In fact, it looks impossible. We have Gustav as our boss sitting on the throne of Leonster Castle, but he has 20 constitution, meaning he's uncapturable and unmovable but let's see if we can somehow find a way to defeat him without killing. This chapter splits our team in half. Each half has its own job to do, with the left having to block two reinforcement spawns and to capture a few enemies. The right side does the same thing, but with half the work. After clearing out the area, we'll need to open this door to let these green units run off towards some armored enemies who can become green units. If we make them all green, we'll gain Xavier as a new unit. So now we have everything going well as well as it could have gone at least. Now it's just us and Gustav. I couldn't think of anything that could really help us, so I had to do some experimenting. Remember the Berserk Staff I said would be useless? Well, the wiki says the condition makes the afflicted unit lose control. So if that unit loses their control, could we maybe Berserk the boss so he'll lose control? No, we can't. Berserk only works if you have higher magic than the unit and if they aren't on a gate or a throne. In this case, Gustav is on a throne, but if someone is already Berserk, would that possibly ignore that rule since they wouldn't have any control? Let's try it out. There are some sorcerers that spawn in on turns 19 and 20, and since we can use steel to reverse heist items to enemies with Lifus, we can give the enemy the Berserk staff while it's Berserk. But there's only one problem. Their staff ranking is at C, and Berserk is an A rank staff so that idea was immediately shot down. The only enemy unit in this chapter that could use the staff was Gustav himself. So I gave it to him to see what he would do, but for some reason he chose to use it on Lara, who has the most health on our team, which apparently swayed his decision. This means we can rig who we want to be Berserk based on the amount of health our units have. So what if we completely ignored trying to make enemies Berserk but instead made our own units berserk. Finding the right unit was easy. It had to be a staff user with higher magic than Gustav. We had multiple of those, but in this case I chose Linoan since she had the most HP out of all the other suitable units. I made her carry a green unit so her magic would be lower than Gustav for the time being. Now that we have our unit selected, we can damage all the units that have more HP, so she'll be prioritized. After bringing everyone out of the priority zone, we can do a reverse heist to give Gustav the Berserk Staff, then when we go to enemy phase, he will successfully Berserk Linoan. Now, we can take back the Berserk Staff and give it to Linoan, as well as capturing her so her magic stat will go back to normal, since carrying a green unit cut it in half. Now once we go to enemy phase, this happens. Right? 
Yes! No way! No way! No way! Gustav is now berserk. But as expected, Gustav didn't leave the throne. I was hoping this would work, but unfortunately he is unmovable. At least in the version of the game I'm playing. I don't know why I tried this, but in the original Japanese version of the game, the boss will move off his throne after being berserk. This is gonna- Oh! He did it! He moved! My brain is astronomical, I cannot believe it. So this means we are successful, and can get past one of the hardest roadblocks in this game. Now we can move on to chapter 19, which is extremely easy compared to what we just did. Chapter 20 was also easy, except for one thing. The win condition requires us to defeat the boss, and the boss is, of course, uncapturable. The only thing I could think of that would fix this was making the boss into an ally like Perny, since it counted him as being defeated previously. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, I don't think that would be possible. No crazy tricks for this one. I tried everything I could possibly try. I let Barrett, the boss of this chapter, get taken down by his own troops via the Berserk Staff. This adds another point to our death counter, which is now stuck at a number more than zero, meaning it is not possible to beat Fire Emblem Thracia 776 while saving everyone. We still have some more chapters left though, so let's see how the rest of the game plays out for this challenge. Chapter 21. We had to rig the RNG so we wouldn't lose any units during enemy phase, and we had to bring Linoan to a space with a church so she could reclass. Overall, it's not that hard. Chapter 22 was also easy. We could use Dean to fly over the water to capture the boss and warp leaf to the end. Chapter 23 is kind of similar, but it has a strict time limit. We need to defeat the boss in turn 1 because said, the bloodthirsty mage, will kill him after the first turn. We had to rig RNG with Dean to capture the boss, and then use Tina to rescue Sias, a new ally who joined us in this chapter. We needed to rescue him since he'll give Leaf Braggy's blade, which we apparently need to kill Raedric in the next chapter. I really hope we won't even need it for that though. We can warp Leaf to the exit to get to chapter 24, the Baron in Black. This chapter splits our team up into three. The left to get the Kaya staff because one of the kids has the key to its door, the right to block reinforcements and capture staff enemies, and the middle to defeat Raedric. Unfortunately for us, we can't even try out the Berserk strategy. His sword grants him plus 20 magic, which makes him unable to get affected with a status effect. So now we're back to trying to figure out this puzzle. But thankfully, we already have a clever solution to this. I've mentioned reverse heists in the past before, and this is when we use a thief like Lithis, Lara, or Perny to trade an item from their own inventory into the enemy's inventory. Since Raedric isn't limited to using swords, we can warp Lithis over to him to initiate the reverse heist, granting him a free bow and arrow. After that, we can warp Marita to talk to Galzus, rescue Galzus while he's holding Marita, rewarp Tina behind Raedric so he'll switch his weapon to the bow in order to attack, and then rescue Lithis so he won't die from all the enemies. After that, I decided to berserk this sorcerer to activate an interesting glitch. If you berserk the first loaded enemy in the map, all enemies with berserk, sleep, or silence staves will not check their own status for targeting, but instead the status of the sorcerer we just used berserk on. So now that our setup is complete, Raedric can become berserk by his own army and move off the throne. There's a whole video about this trick linked in the description that explains it much better than I do, so give it a watch if you want to know the specifics about it. After doing this, we can grab the Kaya staff pretty easily and finish the chapter. We did it! <laughs> Is Raedric really dead? No, we didn't kill him! We didn't kill him! <laughs> chapter 24X. Now that we have the Kaya staff, we can reverse Avel's petrification, but to do this, we will need to reach this room at the top of the screen. The enemies in this chapter are very strong, but they can pretty much take care of themselves since you can force them to hit criticals on themselves with their Devil Axe, which has a percent chance of hurting the user instead of the target. There are also reinforcements every turn, with some being uncapturable. Thankfully, we have the Sleep Edge to help us with this. After a few turns, we can reach Avel with Sarah and remove her petrification, along with one death on our counter. 
Now we just need to escape this chapter with everyone alive and reach our final boss. This was manageable. I filled up the room with the escape point and finished the chapter. Final chapter. This final chapter splits us up into six groups. With these groups, we will need to go inside these six altars to hit an activation switch in the middle of each of them. Our only issue is that there's one boss for each altar, one of them being a clone for Raedric. I spent turn 1 capturing the sorcerers with siege tomes and taking away the boss's items. We also add some sleep edges so we can make the enemy sleep at any time. That made things much easier. Another thing that makes this chapter easy is that the bosses actually move around. This means we were able to bait them outside of the altar and step on the switch they were protecting. This opens up a door to our final boss, Veld, and all I did was steal his weapons with Tina, capture him with Leaf, and finish the game. So, can you beat Thrysha 776 while saving everyone? You cannot. There is one death required throughout the entire game, and it's Barret, who didn't even deserve his fate. I hope you enjoyed this video, it took a ton of effort to make, and I would love it if you shared it with other people who play Fire Emblem games. Anyway, uh, that's all I got. <laughs>